probably made this a bit more systematic but this is just things as they occurred to me and they're things which i've been questioned about and i'll probably miss some things we'll probably do a second thing so we're moving a bit away from sf now into um, the way things work and of course i've talked about book formats on here before i've talked about royals demis octavos what have you i've talked about a format paperbacks b format paperbacks if you're not sure what those things are it's in the other videos maybe there'll be a video about that and that'll be more how can i say more visual i'll actually show you the measurements and what have you so we'll go on to that at another stage something else people have asked me about is what is an imprint well an imprint is a kind of brand identity and the simplest way to really get this across is to look at a publisher like penguin penguin of course a very long established since 1935 was britain's premier paperback house and what you'll see on their books is they all have penguin on them and they'll often have a little little symbol of a penguin that symbol is called a colophon colophon has two meanings we'll come on to that later on so what they'll do within penguin books is they'll have a number of brand identities which will have different meanings for marketing reasons so for example they have one called pelican which is a certain sort of fairly scholastic sort of non-fiction fairly objective and reserved rather than polemical and they've relaunched that recently and they have something called penguin modern classics so these are books which are published pretty much in the sort of modernist area as opposed to the the classic novel period of the 18th 19th century what have you and you will see that they are different to penguin classics so i'm going to flash some examples up on the screen so penguin modern classics and penguin classics are imprints of penguin so that's how it works you very often get a thing where um you'll get an imprint like picador which used to be a very significant imprint because it was literary fiction literary non-fiction very classy quite sort of avant-garde at times and experimental and groundbreaking and that was an imprint of pan a picador is not like that no i will add and pan was part of is part of macmillan so you get this boxes within boxes so you've got macmillan is the parent company pan is the paperback side of things then you have picador is an identity within that piccolo used to be the children's imprint in the same way that with penguin puffin is still the children's imprint of penguin and so on so you get these different identities and with penguin they're easy because it tends to sort of operate downwards and the word penguin usually pops up or it's a p or it's a bird but it doesn't always work that way i mean for example if you look at the classic b format imprints of the 1980s the literary fiction imprints and the larger format paperbacks flamingo was part of fontana abacus was part of sphere not that you'd ever work that out uh, so it, it was all oh, not always implicit paladin was part of granada so again it didn't always seem immediately obvious this was sort of insider knowledge you'd know your imprints and i would know them from using the publisher's catalog so that's how you get to know them and obviously back in those days when you would have books coming into your bookshop from the publisher you'd have the invoice and you'd have the paladins had been with the granada books in with the collins books and they all came from westerhill which was the name of the collins warehouse so imprints sort of are identities within a publishing sort of company there for marketing reasons and for packaging reasons um that's really sort of called when well, you've got vertical publishing um where basically you have a book comes out in hardcover from alan lane which is the hardcover imprint of penguin because penguin's founder was called alan lane then when it comes out in paperback it'll be a penguin that's that's vertical publishing when it stays within the company what used to happen more years ago when there were more publishers and less conglomerates there were publishers who only did hardcovers a classic example of that would be somebody like michael joseph which is now part of penguin michael joseph um, only published hardcovers and then they would auction off the rights to the paperbacks to other publishers so they pop up in all sorts of different things so they they wouldn't immediately go to an obvious source so that's what you call vertical publishing and these days because of the fact that most of the publishers are big sort of conglomerates there's three or four which kind of dominate the british trade i know less about the american european sites you know that's what you call vertical publishing so you get that uniformity as the book descends from hardcover into paperback a year later and so on something else i know that people are keen to try and sort of work out is how you identify um first edition so we'll come on to that as well and the meaning of it and this is quite thorny because the big problem with first edition is that it's something which collectors use and it's something the booksellers use and it's a very misleading bit of terminology because 
basically is incorrect in terms of collecting. Edition specifically refers to content. Okay, so when a book is first written and published, if it's a non-fiction book and it's successful, and it's the sort of thing like a manual or a textbook where it needs to be revised, expanded, altered as the field in which it's relevant to moves on, it would then, the text would then be changed and altered and you would have a different printing which would contain a new text. So that second version of the text would be the second edition. So it's very, very much that way. Now fiction, of course, is very rarely revised. You get odd examples. There are quite a few. I mean, in, most novels won't get revised, but you get occasions when they are. Like a famous one is John Fowles' book, The Magus, which there are two versions of. So every printing, and this is the point, every printing of the original edition, the original content, is a first edition, okay? It's only when it becomes a different text that it becomes a second edition. And this is where the problem comes in, because what collectors should really say is what they collect is a first printing or first impression. So it's entirely possible to buy a book that in its printing history on the rear of the full title page will say first edition in words. But there's a way of looking at the numbers on that page that tell you it's not a first printing. So when people say they collect first editions, they should really say first printings or first impression, which means the same thing, impression and printing, exactly the same thing. So that's something to watch out for. You know, I've seen people selling on eBay, selling the book club edition of um, a Game of Thrones and saying, oh, this is a first edition. And having said to them, no, it isn't. And they said, well, it says first edition on it, but it's not because a first edition as far as the collector is concerned, is a first printing. And it wasn't a book club edition, believe you me. It was the UK um, Collins hardcover was the first one. So you get that thing. So that's slightly confusing. So something we should all do as collectors and as bibliophiles is really say first printing or first impression more. So you get a thing called a number line and I'll flash it up on the screen in a second. And <clears throat> the number line in a book denotes what, what number printing it is. So you'll have a number there. The numbers might be out of an order. It might be one to nine. It might go nine to one. They could all be jumbled up. The point is, if there's a one in that number line, that means it's the first printing, the first edition, as we incorrectly say, the first printing. If the one is absent and the two is there, it's the second printing. If the two is absent, it's the third printing and so on and so on and so on. The number line only started to come into things in sort of early 70s. Before that, it's a lot more difficult to tell. Instead, it would usually say first published 1968, second printing 1969. It will actually verbally say that and it gradually got replaced by the number line. Don't get confused between the number line on the rear of the full title page and the ISBN number, the International Standard Book Number often referred to by booksellers as the SBN, the standard book number, and it later became the international standard book number. Now these days, the ISBN is a 13 digit number that will usually begin with 978. That's in the UK. It will begin with different things in different countries. And it used to be a 10 digit number, and then it went to 13. It went to 13 because that shows you each individual edition of a book will have a different ISBN number. So say if you go and buy something that's out of copyright, like, for example, a Sherlock Holmes um, novel. Say you buy The Sign of Four. There's lots of different editions. They all have different ISBNs because they'll be from different publishers. The ISBN denotes that particular edition from that particular publisher, that particular variant from that particular publisher. So what you'll see is that those things are important. Those numbers are created and sold off. So 13 digits, you imagine how many combinations there are. That shows you how many books there are in the world in terms of different editions. So, you know, there, there was a time when I could look at a ISBN number and tell you from the prefix, from the first three to five letters, who the publisher was. If you wrote down some of these numbers on a piece of paper, I could still do it now, like 0500 would be Thames and Hudson. 0140 or 0141 or shall I, I should say 0140 is Penguin and so on. So you've got to know these things. Now, of course, they're all prefixed by 978. So that's the international standard book number. 
don't confuse it with a number line on the rear of a full title page okay so don't get confused with that and remember if you want to collect first what you're really going for is first impressions doesn't matter if it says first edition first impression because you're not going to get a true first unless you go with the one on the number line very occasionally you'll get somewhere with that number line that's, i've only come across one in about the last 10 years that's very very uncommon other terms you'll get and i'll flash some more pictures up on the screen it's about binding you can have full cloth binding the binding of the book is basically cloth you get quarter bound where the cloth goes is wrapped around the spine of the book and the rest of it is just plain boards you get laminated boards when the hardcover of the book is basically shiny rather than dull and that's laminated boards and you also get things like there's all sorts of terminology i mean we could talk about terminology all day but let's see if we just grab a little hardcover book here and let's see here's aries one by john grant so let's see we'll just grab this so that there that sheet of paper there so we open the book up and we've got that's what you call that area there are the end papers so if you've got pictures of pictorial material in there, that's decorated end papers um that there is the front free end paper or fep ffep front free end paper that's the half title page then you get the full title page and the full title page has the printing history also known as the colophon on there okay so that's that's we'll come on to why that's important in a moment so half title page quite plain and nothing on the rear full title page a bit more of a bang and on the back of the full title page you have the printing history or colophon the term colophon has two sort of meanings really it's also come to mean the publisher's symbol or icon at the bottom of the spine and there's the colophon of david and charles the publisher of this book and this is an old 70s book so that's quite an important thing so if you say colophon it can mean that as well some people say sigil symbol icon but the colophon has two meanings it's basically the printing history it's also the symbol the publisher uses. and sometimes they're really dull like this sometimes they're very distinctive like the little penguin on penguin marks and so on so that's an important one um while we're on the subject um of course the spine of the book runs down there and that's the head of the spine and that's the heel of the spine okay top and bottom if you're getting an author to sign a book for you um you know the professional standard which collectors prefer and we've preferred this for decades and decades is for the author to sign on the full title page okay a real pro who's done a lot of signing will know that straight away but if you're getting your book signed you know be good get them open, open them up ready and ask the author to sign on the full title page should you get them dedicated does it really matter i mean a lot of people say that if it's dedicated as less valid to sell on it depends really who it's dedicated to does it have associational value like for example if an author has presented a copy of a book to another writer and assigned it you know to so and so from so and so then it has great associational value the general feeling is though is you just want it flat signed and by flat signed we mean no dedication because it's easier to sell on i'm never put off by inscriptions myself because it's part of history and what have you but get them to sign there one thing i would say is if you go to a signing note particularly at a literary festival and this is something that's crept in from lit fests and and it's really really not good is don't really you know don't let them sign the book with a sharpie a sharpie looks awful sharpies really should be called blunties you know get a really nice pen get something you know which has got a finer point and you know have it there for the author because they might only have been given a sharpie because the sharpie signature just looks crass it just looks horrible you know you want a nice fine piece of handwriting so take a decent pen no to sharpies i never ever ever let any author i'm doing an event with sign with a sharpie unless they want to and usually they don't want to they usually want a nice pen so you know in that case you know be prepared take your own and if you want a particular color like i've got authors to sign occasionally you'll get a page which is black so take a silver pen along if that's if that's an option because you know it's kind of important stuff really to get a nice sort of collection of signed books together and is it better to have a signed first have a first impression well you know does it really matter it's only one little number after all but the general standard is yeah try and get your first sign but as long as you enjoy the whole process you enjoy collecting you enjoy reading that's all that really matters 
something else we can talk about is I often talk about the text block of a book and I'll show you that this is the text block is basically you just pull the binding weight that's the text block okay the pages that's all it is okay and you occasionally get these days books which have they call a sprayed edge it's not a sprayed edge it's a toned text block okay and yeah I know I'm a pedant I don't care it's all fun so you know the text block that's the text block okay if it's rough and uneven and the pages appear to be a different length that's what you call a deckled edge or an American cut some people say deckled edge is the correct term so we go with that what else have we got something somebody asked me was about um how do you become a bookseller and what they meant is how do you become a book dealer well you know <laughs> it's it's one of those things you've got to acquire the stock from somewhere and they asked if there were warehouses from which people could buy things that the publishers hadn't managed to sell and the answer is of course and books which publishers haven't managed to sell and they've really given up on are called remainders and they will sell them to remainder merchants now remainder merchants will then will buy these books in bulk they'll buy 50 100 a thousand what have, have you and they will sell them on to other retailers i mean a classic example of this is there's a chain called the works in the uk most of the books you'll find in the works are remaindered they are books which haven't sold so they moved on or they are books which are specially printed print on demand and we'll come to print on demand um, in a moment just for that outlook because they'll be in a different format to the one you'll find in your regular bookshop now remainders when they sold on over the years and this is going back decades and decades at least 50 years they will be sort of marked in different ways like there was a point where you'd see the text block would be marked with a magic marker they'd be like a black stripe on it in the jacket of the book the cover of the book the front cover there'd be a hole punch literally a round hole like a bullet hole there'd be a saw cut in the text block we look like somebody put a hacksaw through it and um sylvan um, who watches the channel hi sylvan who's out there in the west indies he mentioned that um where he is the sort of bottom right hand corner of the front of the jacket is cut off and he said what is that and that i've not seen that but that's almost certainly a remainder mark whereas it's, it's sort of like a bargain book that's been sold on so that's an important thing so that's something to watch out for you know it's an interesting thing remainders because i can think of things which i bought as remainders that were flops commercially when they came out back in the late 70s early 80s and now they're incredibly collectible books burn down the night by craig key street the native american sf writer and um, his novel about jim morrison i mean that was everywhere you couldn't give it away now it's super super rare it's a great book as well um robert calvert of hawkwind his novel hype which is about a rock and roll star you know it was everywhere bruce sterling's involution ocean great sf novel you know he couldn't give these things away they were all remaindered so you know today's remainder can be tomorrow's classic that's the funny thing so that's something to watch out for as well so when you go in a bargain bookshop the books will be cheaper and it's usually because the remainders or because they've been printed specially and this is an interesting thing um pd print on demand pod print on demand what it means is that this is relatively new tech which has only been around about 15 years um if you're a publisher and you have a lot of books on hand in your warehouse because it costs money it costs money to print them it costs money to store them they take up space what have you and it's money tied up now of course if you have a digital file of course there's a time when nobody had a digital file of the text then you can run a copy off because printing technology is, has moved on now so a publisher now doesn't have to keep a lot of physical copies and stuff and i mean if you're talking about my books i mean this book this is a first printing of my first book and it had seven standard printings and now it's print on demand so bloomsbury anc black they don't keep any copies of this in the warehouse they might keep a few but they keep the digital file and they print them off as you order them so what you'll find as well is if you've got a print or demand one it's got a shinier cover than this um usually they're on cheaper paper but the print on demand edition of this book the paper is actually nicer and shinier and it feels slightly thinner as well so what you will find is the laminate of the page of the, of the cover tends to bow a little um so i'm not generally not keen on print on demand books and um you know they are environmentally sound though and sometimes they're an acid free paper as well so pd print on demand means that there isn't a physical copy in the warehouse so there won't be many but if you order one from a bookshop or what have you then one gets printed off specially for you so it can be a bit of a delay but it's a good way of keeping a book in print the problem with that is that most bookshops will not keep print on demand books in stock because they're non-returnable they can't get rid of them they can't sell them 
and because often the cover quality and the format they're usually a trade format they're bigger than a standard paperback they don't always fit the racking and things so they're not kept so they're a double-edged sword so it keeps my book in print but at the same time it means it doesn't get into bookshops so people don't come across it because people only come across it because of publicity so if they don't know it's out there they're not going to place their order for it whereas i would prefer it was actually in a bookshop in a pile but there you go but what can you expect with a book which is about 16 years old anyway so you've got to be realistic about these things so print on demand is there and didn't exist until about 15 years ago what you also see is um, people ask about what does out of print mean well every day in my job not every day but regularly people will ask me for a book and they'll say i know it's available and I always smile ruefully on my inside because you don't know it's available. Nobody knows if a book is available until you ring the publisher, ask for their trade counter. And by trade counter, I mean that's where, you know, a bookshop or a book dealer can speak to them because they have an account with the publisher. They can buy books from the publisher um, and then ask about availability. Availability means does the publisher, who is the sole producer of that volume, they own the copyright. Do they have it in stock? That's what it means. Do they have it in stock in their warehouse or distribution center? Doesn't mean anything else. Available means in stock at the publisher. So a book can be sitting on bookshop shelves all around the country, but it can be unavailable because you can't order fresh copies from the publisher because the publisher no longer has it in stock. So this brings us to out of print. What does out of print mean? Out of print means that the publisher has sold all the copies that they have of the book, they're out there in the marketplace. Some will be in bookshops, some will be at online warehouses or places like Amazon, what have you. But the book itself is out of print. In other words, it's unavailable to order from the publisher. Generally speaking, most publishers don't deal with the public direct. Some of the smaller ones will, but you, there's no point in ringing up a big publisher like Penguin asking if the trade counter, you know, if you're Mrs. Miggins of Biggin Hill and asking them just to send something out. It's not going to happen. That's what booksellers are for. So you go to a bookseller, whether you're high street or online, preferably you go to your high street um, or your indie or what have you, your chain, and you get it from a real bookshop. It's a much more fun experience. So there you go. So that's out of print. Um, you also get things like situations like someone, someone will say, can you get this me? And the bookseller will look at what information they have and they'll say, no, I'm afraid it's reprinting. What that means is the book is either physically actually being reprinted at that point or that it's reprinting under consideration, RPUC, which means that the publisher is engaged in a lengthy process whereby they're trying to assess demand through incoming orders to see whether it's financially viable to reprint the book and get stock back into the warehouse or whether they're going to render it out of print and not produce anymore or just have it as PD, POD, print on demand, a digital file so you can run one off. So you will hear that. You'll also hear TOS, OS, temporarily out of stock or out of stock. Publishers um, will quote that as an availability status and for booksellers that means that it's probably in transit between one warehouse and another so it's been printed but it's not at the distribution center yet because they're often different places there was a time when british publishers would often have their own press lots of publishers around the world have their own press and in britain around show where i live in the west country in somerset you know you go back 20 years ago and there were six or seven world-class printers around here and some of them were affiliated to publishers like mcdonald's who were in Portland near here and others weren't they were just doing all sorts of press they used to be a bath press and they did books for all sorts of publishers and a lot of this went overseas mostly to the far east and of course in covid that meant a problem because books couldn't get reprinted very quickly or they could but they had to be shipped over so they, there's all that to contend with as well publication dates and embargoes well Every book has a publication date. It won't always be firm. If it's an academic or sort of non-fiction book, it won't be firm. Fiction books tend to have a firm publication date. Hardly anything is embargoed. That means that, you know, you're not allowed to sell it before a certain point. In the music and sort of DVD industry, music and film industry, those embargoes are very, very, very strict. So say if somebody has a new CD and LP coming out on a particular day, you won't be able to buy it beforehand. HMV or wherever, your indies, they won't be able to sell it beforehand. They're not allowed to. They'll get into trouble if they do. And it's the same with all. It's like a release date. The reason for the embargo is that it's to focus the marketing and advertising on that date to get people excited to get them looking forward to that day, to try and get that big bang where they buy things. And in the book trade, 
various sort of booksellers, publishers have tried to get this going for decades and decades, but it never really came together until the advent of the Harry Potter books. I can remember when I worked for WH Smith way back at the start of my career, and I worked for two shops of them. In the one shop, we didn't bother. In the second shop, they were very strict on the embargoes. And you had to sort of look out the back every day into the stock room and think, what's coming out today? And usually publication dates are Monday and Thursday. Occasionally you get a Tuesday. Monday and Thursday, usually the two dates. And books will often appear in bookshops, you know, a week or 10 days before they're published. So people come in and say, oh, I know it's published today, but you've already had it out for like a week, you know, or sometimes it's late. Usually it's early. But with something major, and I mentioned the Harry Potter books because that's when the first time it actually worked. Because the first two or three, they limped out and they did okay. Then it became a massive thing, the biggest thing in book selling, you know, for a very, very, very long time. And because people wanted to do events and it was exciting because it was for kids um, and take advantage of publicity and you would actually get fined or you would not be allowed to get the next book until after it was published. It would hurt you financially. Everybody managed to stick the embargoes. People didn't break them. And it was a good thing for marketing. So it was quite exciting. And now you get, you know, where I work, we'll have, there's always an embargo list, certain number of things, which you can't put out on certain dates. And it's quite exciting because it creates, you know, a sort of, a sort of free on around that particular date where people are waiting for things to come out. And that's always a good thing for the book trade because we can get people in for the big things, then there's a chance they will look at other things and sort of things they maybe not thought about. So that's something which has really come together really in the last sort of 20 years. Proof copies, arcs and galleys, arc, advanced reading copy. Well, these days it's quite easy to get arcs from places like NetGalley and by contacting publishers. This is relatively new. 10, 15 years ago, this didn't happen. And in the sort of sharp end of the book trade, if you work in a bookshop like me, we always call them proofs. They're called proof copies. And they were sent out um, mostly to booksellers to get them to read these books, which publishers wanted you to get excited about. Um, you know, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it was stuff which was dull. And, you know, you weren't interested. And they were often very, very plain. Um, you weren't allowed to quote from them. They were uncorrected text. There'd be things like indexes or pictures would be missing. And that still happens. But gradually, the idea of the proof becoming an arc, something more beautiful is out there. I've only ever kept two proofs in my life, and they're both Jake Arnott books. And I got them because the one was the first Jake Arnott book. There was no hardcover. I got the proof, and I loved it. And it was just as as nice as the actual paperback. And also the slightly different text when it was published for legal reasons, it was changed. And also his book, Johnny Come Home. Again, that was a paperback original. There was no hardcover. And the text in the paperback is different, again, for legal reasons. So, you know, I've got the definitive text. And those are the only ones I've kept. And, you know, I don't really consider them that important. Some people collect them, but there you go. So the ARC, as something going to the general public, to social media, people to people blogging and things, has only really come up as the internet's got more popular. Before that, a member of the general public would never get hold of a proof. You know, I know um, a bookseller or two from way, way back, people I work with, in the sort of 80s and 90s. One particularly told me about when he worked in the book trade in the 60s and 70s in Chan Cross Road, there would be book dealers who would give him illegal substances for proofs which were by important authors. So there you go, a little bit of the old um, literary underground there. Um, a galley. A galley is the actual physical copy of the proof that goes out to the writer for them to correct with a pen and then send back. Um, when I wrote my books, I only remember having a galley once. You mostly just did it via email, you know, and the actual thing of, you know, actually marking, correcting is, is quite uncommon now. But I, I'm beginning to think that maybe that was the best way. One of my books, you know, you, you correct things and then other things get uncorrected and it goes back and forth. And with a book like Lord of the Rings, I mean, if you read the history of Lord of the Rings, there doesn't mean a single correct text, you know, other errors creep in. So maybe a galley is the way to go. So that's the difference between a proof, an arc and a galley. Vaguely the same things, but important distinctions between them. Something you'd also hear booksellers talk about is what's called a subscription order. So basically when a book comes out, you were usually offered it by the seller, by the publisher, um, you know, three months beforehand. And the way it used to work, and it doesn't work this way so much now in the book trade, is I would spend a lot of time and representatives, reps, sales reps, we would call them, would travel around the UK. They would make an appointment, you have an appointment diary. And this was happening, you know, pretty much 
right up until about 10 years ago. And a huge part of my job for years was buying and whatever shop I was running or working in. And I did loads and loads of buying. I, I bought books this way for like 30 years, you know. And you would have your appointment, the rep would turn up and they'd show you what was coming out in three months time. And they would have a folder with plastic sheets inside and information copies of the jacket and a flat form what have you and they give you the sales talk and you'd say i'll have x of that i'll have six of that ten of that i'm not buying that that's awful um no i don't want that blah 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 and it would go that way and it was a good fun part of the job it took up a heck of a lot of time and cost a lot of money there are far fewer reps around now um you can get like packages regularly from wholesalers once a month and what have you and i think really reps really now only sort of call on, they don't call on the chains very much at all. There's very few of them left, but it's a shame because it was it was a fun thing. It was an interactive thing, and you got to know more about the publisher and the way they worked, and you formed friendships. There were some reps you didn't want to see again. You know, it wasn't it wasn't all plain sailing. And you'd have things like John Calder, the avant-garde publisher. He used to rep his own books in the last years of his life, so I got to know him, and that was amazing. You know, because the actual publisher was selling his own books in. And you know, it's fantastic stuff. So you'd have a subscription order and you do that a few months in advance. These days, the big chains, maybe they don't always sort of order so soon and it's done more centrally. It's less expensive that way. It's more cost effective. There's, you know, ifs, ands and buts on both sides of this. So that's kind of how it works. Um, something as an aside here that comes up is stationary. If you get, and, and the nature of what a book is, Stationary, really, if you're talking about, say, a diary, for example, a diary might have an ISBN on it, an international standard book number, and a diary might be in what you call a book form. You open it like a book, it's got pages. That doesn't mean it's a book, it's a codex. The book is the text. The codex, what we think of as a book, is the current format of the book, which has been the thing for about 1500 years. If you look at the history of the Bible, which is a really fascinating thing, there's a time when if you had a Bible, we're going back now to about the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries. It would be a load of scrolls. Each book of the Bible was a scroll and it would be rolled up and it would be in a box. You have like a trunk. And so there was no definitive running order. The Bible were just all these scrolls. So if you look before the codex, the bound book with a spine and pages, what have you. So that's interesting. So if you think something like a diary, something you write in is stationary. It's not a book. So, you know, that's an interesting distinction. And people often think that a bookshop will have stationery. These days, we mostly do, because you need to sell other things because, you know, it's competitive. If you just sell books, it can be quite a tough sell. You need to bring extra money in from people who are more casual buyers who aren't sort of readers or serious readers and they want some other stuff. And that's really come in this country from companies like WH Smith, who really is a department store. People who was a bookseller, they've done books, magazines, stationery, confectionery, whatever. So the idea that a bookshop will have things like greetings cards or stationery comes from that end of things. If I could have my way, if I could have my bookshop in an ideal world, I would not have any stationery, just books. But these days, everybody's got to sort of do a bit because it just brings you some easy money in. So there you go. Publishers, um, distribution, things like that. Um, Publishers usually, the bigger ones, will have their own distribution centres, their own warehouses. Sometimes you'll get a firm like Turnaround, as an example in the UK, who will have a warehouse, a distribution centre, and they'll have a sales force. So if you see a rep from Turnaround, and I've got a friend who works at Turnaround, hi Alistair, watches the channel, we don't see enough of each other. He goes around and turn around, distribute loads and loads of small presses. So he'll go around, he'll see people once a month, he'll have a catalogue and he will sell the books in and people will play subscription orders for them so that they come in a few months later and they'll all come from one warehouse. Whereas most of the bigger publishers have got their own warehouse. If you're um, a chain bookseller like Smith's or Waterstones, um, they have distribution centres which are very big, very sophisticated, very, very efficient. Um, book distribution has moved on enormously in the last 10 years and you know you'll get something far more quickly than you used to far more quickly than you ever did from a publisher so that's a great thing to have as well you have your own distribution center and so instead of a publisher like penguin sending books to 300 different bookshops in the same chain they just send them to one distribution center and obviously that's better environmentally as well so that's something that's really been a massive improvement in the last 10 years or so and it's really cut down the delivery times and things as well returns um 
when it's the returns i don't mean when you take a book back and you've got a refund because there's something wrong with it i mean what happens to the unsold books well the whole book trade has really sort of depended on returns for a long long time and the way it used to work is that you would have a book in stock in the states it's always been a bit more rapacious um i think it was something like it was it got down to just a few weeks at one point i've, I've read and heard stories about american paperbacks only being on the stands a short period of time so when new books come out and in the uk they would have 90 days three months to sell after three months you could send them back usually though you had to get permission from the rep so you'd have to get when your reps coming to do the subscription order you'd have to prepare a list of returns and they would sign them or not and you would send them back you get the credit obviously you had to pay the return of the books at one point there's a thing called stripping where you just pull the, the cover of the book right off and you send the covers back and you throw the books away terrible for the environment so it's a strip book so that was something that used to happen um i worked in academic book selling for about 10 years and i stopped doing that in 2008 and the major academic publishers it was what you call open returns so after 90 days you didn't have to get authorization just send things back because they're very seasonal the textbook would sell for a few weeks while it was relevant to a course then it would stop just send it about credit what have you and it was a very important way of keeping your cash flow going and keeping the business fluid but of course the thing with returns is that it is not good environmentally so in my view um, the entire trade needs to step up that way it's a lot better than it was print on demand helps with that particularly things like textbooks and it really kind of means that you you know if, if you're doing that all the time it's, it's it's just huge costs in all sorts of ways so really what we need in this country and in countries worldwide probably is fewer titles produced fewer books published better marketing so that more than sell because what i've seen in my career over the years is that once people know about a book doesn't matter it's about there's an audience for it people will buy it people will buy all sorts of things if they know they're out there so if you're starting a publishing firm spend as much on the marketing as you do on the actual publishing and you'll sell more um trans world corgi and bantam they're now part of um, penguin random house they used to be their own company and i remember you would sit down and do a subscription order with them and they would publish maybe only half the titles that the publisher like say arrow or penguin or harper collins would but you would see the ad shelves you know the adverts of bus stops and what have you a lot a lot more so market the books is the answer i'm just going to finish with a few words about um bibliography the art of listing and describing books and in the uk the sort of market leader in that there used to be a couple of firms doing it one called whitaker's and another and they produced british books in print which when i started was a multi-volume book um even though i never used that it was a microfiche which was something you put into like a little projector little plastic sheets with tiny letters on and that that was fun and then that got, got replaced by cd rom and then online sources on your sort of computer database and what have you and whitakers were you know the market leader in that and then a just a fellow sort of competitor came along called nielsen book data and they did a similar thing and i was personally never as keen on nielsen then the two merged and it seemed to me that the standards went downhill from that so these days books in print would be pretty much a website from nielsen book data and that would be your primary bibliographic resource and i'm not going to go into bibliography in a big way here uh, because it's a big subject and to talk to you about how you search your books and find them and what have you that in itself you know is is a subject for another video and i do it in work every day <laughs> i don't really want to do it outside work so going back to my experience just to talk about what i feel was the golden age of book selling and i was lucky to work in in that period the golden age of book selling in britain was 1982 to 1995 and i'll tell you why way way back over 100 years ago there was something in britain called the nba the net book agreement and this was something that came in about in the 1890s and it was an agreement between publishers and booksellers that they would all sell books for the same price so if you bought a copy of a book from a certain publisher it would be the same price everywhere it, it wouldn't be like it is now where there'll be some money off in smith's or it'll be some different different price in waterstones different price on amazon you didn't have to shop around it was the same price so if the if the printing of the price on the book was 7.99 it was 7.99 everywhere so what bookshops did then they competed on range and service now the nba was a good thing because it meant that if you had something like a tv tie-in where you had a david amber tv series or something popular like that that grabbed the mass imagination you sold an awful lot of copies at full price if you take jamie oliver's books now the cook 
Hardly any of Jamie Oliver's books are sold at full price. And they're usually 28, 29 pounds. They're nearly all sold half price. They're just to get people in the store. So not much money is actually made by the booksellers. Back when the NBA was in force, you made a lot of money and it helped support the other books. And the NBA collapsed in 1995 and it was judged to be a cartel. And that's when discounting came in. The result of that was that generally speaking, nonfiction went up in price. So if you like biographies and history, they've gone up in price more quickly than say fiction has done as a result of that because the less popular things cost more money to publish so you put the price up and the consumer pays for it so anyway that was one part of it and i say 1982 to 95 so 95 with the end of the nba really sort of marked the end of the golden age for me and i cite 1982 because 1982 is when waterstone started and you know what was significant about that was the fact that before that moment large bookshops in the uk were uncommon there weren't many of them there were just a few here and there when tim waterstone started his company and that's waterstones with the apostrophe s no it doesn't have the apostrophe in the s and tim waterstone isn't involved anymore um it's a different different sort of company and you know it's moved on it's changed things move as, as they do in the corporate world and basically tim's vision was to get big bookshops into lots of cities in Britain so that they could showcase the range, the marvellous range of British publishing that's out there because small bookshops can't do that. And that's one problem at the moment in the UK. There's lots of great indie booksellers, but they're too small to keep the range. They can't showcase. They can only cherry pick. And, you know, while you do need to cherry pick, there's an awful lot of great things in print. So only large chain shops can do that. So that was the beauty of it. So what Waterstones did alongside, there's a chain called Dylan's, and there were big branches of Blackwell and what have you. And there were some indies which were big around the UK, like Leah's in Cardiff, George's in Bristol. And I'm sure in your part of Britain, there were other ones as well. It meant that there was lots and lots of big bookshops suddenly for about 13 years before the NBA came along. And we saw Borders come to the UK and it was just wonderful. You know, there were big bookshops everywhere and it couldn't last because the NBA went. And also shortly after that, um, we had the dawn of Amazon and the internet and everything exploded and it became a lot harder for bookshops to sell books. So I was lucky to work through that period. I started book selling in 84. In that time, there were lots of big bookshops and I worked for all sorts of companies and it was very exciting. This is Outlaw Bookseller. Any questions, you know, do subscribe, like, comment, all that. But any questions, as I say, pop them underneath and I'll either answer them directly underneath the description or I'll do another video about them. Bye for now.